Peter, I, I would say Peter wrote first, first and second Peter. In second Peter, Jesus, I mean, Peter says that he saw. Saw the transfiguration. Uh, the transfiguration, exactly. That's not the resurrection. Okay. Oop. These were the men besides Joseph Smith who claimed to have seen Moroni. And yet here he is trying to say, well, you know, four against two is better. No, it's not. You have zero against Peter, James, and Paul, and Mary Magdalene. I'm just giving you my reasoning that I why Moroni's not convincing. To I understand, right. but I don't think you've listened to my case here. Okay. In one sense, I'm actually on Ehrman's side. We have veered way, way out into the weeds from the original topic. But they're in a worldview that could, that they allows are too that. They're in a worldview. No. They're in an apocalyptic where, 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 worldview okay, that where, expects Where was the, the Messiah? So Ehrman is playing games right now. And I suspect he knows he is. And he can get away with this because not a lot of people are aware of, again, this manipulative framing that he's doing. And there it is. We have now discovered the reason why Ehrman will never say that Jesus rose from the dead. Doesn't matter what kind of evidence lines up for it. Resurrections do not happen. Period. End of story. The end. It's a violation of the laws of physics. Welcome back to another Pastor Reacts. My name is Nate Sala. I'm the president of Wise Disciple, where we are helping you become the effective Christian that you were meant to be. Before I jumped into this particular ministry, I was a pastor, and before that, I was a debate teacher. And so if you put those things together, like peanut butter and jelly, you get this channel, apparently. Well, today we're looking at a video that a lot of you suggested that I react to. It's a recent episode of Unbelievable with Justin Brierley, one of my favorite shows uh, to just watch, you know, conversations-wise. This one is Bart Ehrman versus Justin Bass. I think the topic is, did Jesus of Nazareth rise from the dead? So let's go. Okay. Hello and welcome to the big conversation from Premier Unbelievable, brought to you in partnership with John Templeton Foundation. I'm your host, Justin Briley. The big conversation is all about questions around science, philosophy, history, and culture with big thinkers across the belief spectrum. So little disclaimer at the outset, my issue with these kinds of debates has always been that, uh, on Unbelievable, has always been that they're not really debates though they're discussions you know i'm coming from a more formal debate background so i'm used to looking at policy debates lincoln douglas public forum debates but that's just not what uh, a lot of these kinds of discussions are so it's hard for somebody like me to just show up and start holding somebody accountable to a structure of debate that these two probably did not agree to in the first place it was probably understood that they're going to have a free-flowing discussion where Two people largely disagree with each other, which, by the way, I think is actually way more valuable for those of us who want to think through issues and come to our own conclusions. So, again, I love the Unbelievable Show. I'm just trying to be transparent about my difficulties with doing a debate teacher reacts to this. So what I'm going to try to do is I'll talk about who's doing a better job challenging the other guy. And then I might step in with some of my own thoughts about the discussion and that's probably the best I can do with something like this. So again, let's get into it. Today, we're discussing the central claim of Christian faith. Did Jesus of Nazareth rise from the dead? The whoop, rise whoop. of Christianity, of course, has shaped the modern world. But are its historical origins best explained by naturalistic means? Or is the explanation the first followers gave, that Jesus had risen from the dead, still a plausible option for people today? Well, Bart Ehrman is a well-known... By the way... The topic is, did Jesus rise from the dead? Were the claims given by Jesus' apostles and his first followers plausible? The immediate question that I have is, what the heck is Bart Ehrman doing at the table then? <laughs> you know, Ehrman is a historian, and historians don't answer these kinds of questions according to Ehrman. He talks about this a lot. Historians, given their particular methodology to understand history, are not equipped to answer this question. So what is Ehrman doing there? So this is from Ehrman's book, How Jesus Became God. Take a look at this. As a historian, I do not think that we can show historically that Jesus was in fact raised from the dead. Uh, to be clear, I'm not saying the opposite either, that historians can use the historical disciplines in order to demonstrate that Jesus was not raised from the dead. I argue that when it comes to miracles such as the resurrection, historical sciences simply are of no help in establishing exactly what happened. So again, I ask, what is Bart Ehrman doing here for this discussion then? <laughs> the topic is, did Jesus rise from the dead? That means we need to see people take a position on this question, right? Or else, what's this discussion going to be? My prediction is, because I've seen Ehrman do this before, you'll see him only go so far, and then he'll stop, and he'll draw a line in the sand. And the other guy, 
Justin Bass is going to want to keep walking down the path towards an inference. And Ehrman is going to say, no, 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 you can't say that. You can't do that. New Testament historian whose books include Misquoting Jesus, The Triumph of Christianity, and Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife. Bart is an agnostic. He doesn't believe in the miraculous claims of the Bible, including the resurrection of Jesus, but he's always happy to discuss it with those who do. One of those is Justin Bass, a New Testament scholar who's taught at various institutions, including in Jordan in the Middle East. Now, Justin is a Christian, and in his book, The Bedrock of Christianity, he argues there are a number of bedrock facts concerning the death and resurrection of Jesus agreed upon by the majority of New Testament scholars. And today, he's going to be explaining why he believes the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is the best explanation of both scripture and history. So, Justin... And is anybody else weird like me? And right now you're seeing Robert England versus Eric Bana. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but Ehrman definitely resembles Robert England. Hmm. Shenanigans. Best explanation of both scripture and history. So Justin and Bart, welcome along to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. I hope it won't be too confusing for you, Bart, having two Justins in front uh, of you today. I am feeling that I'm being ganged up on. <laughs> but it's okay. Beard I, can, to Justin I can handle it. <laughs> and unbeard to Justin. You can see the difference. Uh, virtually all will accept that uh, Jesus appeared to, or, or uh, Peter believed Jesus appeared to him. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, believed he appeared to him. Uh, Paul, obviously, uh, believed he appeared to him. And then uh, we can bring in Mary Magdalene, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure Bart, uh, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but believes Mary Magdalene also had that experience. She's, she's uh, uh, accounted for in all four Gospels, being the first to actually witness the risen Jesus. So that so so those four would be kind of the bedrock yeah. uh, eyewitnesses. Well, well, why don't we stick with the, those specific ones and and get your take on that? But um, so, to what degree do you agree that that at least people claimed to have seen the risen Jesus? Um, I, yeah, I think it's probably right. I, th I mean, Paul certainly. Paul um, Paul tells us that he he did. The problem with these others, of course, is they don't tell us that. Uh, so we don't have, you know, Peter didn't leave us writings where he said, I saw Jesus. James didn't leave us writings. We don't know who the 500 were, none of this. So what his Peter didn't say that he saw the risen Jesus. Does Ehrman mean that Peter didn't write it down? Like he didn't literally say that phrase in like first and second Peter, which is true. I saw the risen Jesus, right? We don't have those in the epistles. Okay, fair enough. But wait a sec. Peter does talk about the resurrection of Jesus in his first epistle though, right? 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Seems strange for Peter to do that, knowing that Paul had been claiming that Peter saw the risen Jesus, knowing that Luke was saying that Peter saw the risen Jesus. Uh, both of these men were contemporary to Peter, and now Peter is saying that Jesus is resurrected in his own letter. I mean, you, you have an established church in the first century holding to Peter's profession of seeing the risen Jesus, and Peter doesn't want to seem to correct any of these claims about him? I wonder why. Unless, maybe it really happened. <laughs> Isn't that the simplest explanation? What tend to do, of course, is to examine their sources of information. And the most important thing is to know what the sources are, uh, to determine whether they uh, uh, are, uh, are reliable or not, uh, to, and to see what they say. I mean, so we don't, we, we, we infer, that pr I, th I think that, see f that Peter probably did say that he saw Jesus, and I think James probably did. I don't know about the 500. They come out of nowhere. Well, then why did you make a point to say that the problem is Peter never said he saw the risen Jesus in his writings? You literally just said that a few seconds ago. Is that really a problem or, or do we have enough evidence to infer that Peter saw the risen Jesus, which is why you say that you think he did? In which case, that's not a problem, though, right? See, this is what Ehrman does on a regular basis. He says, well, you know, here's a problem. You know, here's another problem. Well, here's a huge problem over here. As a debater, this fits into the category of laying a framework. Okay, you know, so far so good. But you could make the argument that this is known as manipulative framing. And what that means is when you use negative words like problem, you know, particularly when a true problem does not exist, you're simply describing the regular process of making an inference based on the historical evidence, you seem to be manipulative there. You, you, you come across as being disingenuous. Imagine a homicide detective saying, well, you know, I have the suspect admitting he was at the crime scene when the victim was murdered, and I have several other witnesses claiming the suspect confessed 
to the crime. By the way, these witnesses are known associates of the suspect, and they told a lot of other people about the suspect's confession. Suspect never denied it. But you know what the problem is? Uh, he never wrote down the words, I'm the killer, though. Is that really a problem? In, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's and no... Mary Magdalene? Um, well, we don't have anything from her either, obviously. I know, so, but do you believe that she had an experience? Um, yeah, I do, okay. uh, and I believe, for. and I believe that um, I believe that in a lot of religious traditions, you get reports like that, uh, and so my my issue with um, with this kind of bedrock thing is whether uh, it's appropriate to consider these kinds of claims outside of other claims for other religious figures. Mm -hmm. Do we do we treat them equally? Or do we provide a kind of a, do we say, well, it's, it's more likely true because it's in the Bible and less likely true if it's in the Mormon tradition or if it's in the Muslim tradition or if it's in ancient Greek and Roman mythology or not just mythology, ancient Greek and Roman history. And so do you give equal weight to everything? And if so, then how do you, why is it that you prefer these witnesses to the others? So that's an interesting move. Did you see what just happened? After begrudgingly agreeing that the eyewitness testimony of those four people, right, Peter, James, Paul, Mary, are probably legitimate. You know, I mean, the experience of the risen Jesus probably is what happened to them. Now, Ehrman wants us to shift and consider the legitimacy of other miracle claims from different religions. The question for Bass is, why not just stick to the claims of the resurrection of Jesus in order to make an inference and answer the question of tonight's topic? But you know what? This is actually an advantageous move on the part of Ehrman, because what he wants to do is demonstrate that for the same reason that Christians dismiss Mormon claims and Muslim claims, etc., we should dismiss resurrection of Jesus claims. So Ehrman is doing well as an interlocutor. All right. Let's see what happens next. Great question. Um, what is the evidence? You know, so, so my, my question would be, what is the evidence? You brought up Islam. You brought up Mormonism. Well, in Islam this only supernatural really claim is to Muhammad. That's one, you know, one eyewitness. And I agree with Deuteronomy. We shouldn't trust anything unless it's at least two or three witnesses. So we have four that you agree with, you know, in Christianity. When it comes to Mormonism, again, Joseph Smith is the only person to say that Moroni <laughs> appeared to him. And he, he says Jesus and God the Father and a lot of other strange so things. I'm not sure, Justin. But only he's... one person, o only one eyewitness in both those cases, both those religions you brought up. But right. I'd like to hear the evidence. Well, I don't, Greek I don't know. Roman. I don't know if you've studied Mormonism very much. Oh, I've studied a lot. There are eleven eyewitnesses, and they to, all to the golden plates. Yes. Yeah. So yes. we're going to compare and golden plates for, to the resurrection of Jesus. No, I'm, I'm just saying, if you're a historian, yeah. And what you're doing is you're saying we're going to trust eyewitnesses. Okay, I'm fine with them seeing golden plates, but what does that? What does that? Four tell of them us? say they saw Moroni give them to him. Four saw him. Some of half who of, actually half of signed them, affidavits. Half of them left the faith. They left. No, they, they didn't. They left. Joseph they Smith. left Joseph Smith. Well, they, they but abandoned they Joseph Smith. Yeah. But when they abandoned Joseph Smith, they continued to say that they saw Moroni. Right. But, so do you that's not true. You can look into this, and I, I encourage you to. Although that's a rabbit trail. The problem here is. Well, see, now I'm sounding like Ehrman. <laughs> okay. The problem is, LDS history is shoddy because they will only affirm certain things these witnesses said, and then they will downplay or ignore other things. The four witnesses to Moroni were allegedly, now I had to, I had to look this up for reference, uh, Martin Harris, David Whitmer, um, and Oliver Cowdery. Okay, The fourth witness was Joseph Smith himself. The issue with these three witnesses to Moroni, apart from Joseph Smith, is they do change their testimony over time with regard to what they saw. And all three were excommunicated from the church and were tarnished in terms of their reputation by the LDS church and its leaders. Uh, Joseph Smith called David Whitmer a dumb beast. Martin Harris was said by Mormons to have a lying, deceptive spirit. He was of his father, the devil, and that the wrath of God was on him. Why? Well, one of the things Martin Harris did was he recanted his testimony. He said he never actually saw the plates, even though he originally said he did. Whitmer did the same thing, said he never actually saw the plates, changed his story a few times on that. And then these gentlemen went on to make other grand claims that could not be substantiated. You see where this is going? If Ehrman wants to say, well, you know, let's look at other religious claims to miracles, then he's going to have to notice that there is a qualitative difference between the ethos of, say, Peter, Paul, and James— because these men were tortured and died for their testimony, never recanting, never being excommunicated from the Christian church, never 
being denounced for having lying deceptive spirits and being of their father the devil. But you'll also have to notice that the ethos of the Mormon witnesses are not there. Once you press into the details of the religious claims of Joseph Smith and his compatriots to the religious claims of the apostles of Christ, there is no comparison. And Ehrman knows this. He has to know that. He's a historian, right? That's his, that's his thing. So then what is the point of bringing all this up? It seems to me you have two options. You're either ignorant and are making illegitimate comparisons, or you know what you're doing and you're misleading folks on purpose. To suggest historical Christian claims about Jesus and historical Mormon claims are on par with each other is to, at the very least, mislead people that are, that are watching this video. You know what I mean? And then you wonder, okay, is that unintentional or is that intentional? At the very least, I will say this. Ehrman is doing a good job handling himself as an interlocutor against Justin Bass. I, I think that's pretty obvious. You credit those. Okay, well, that's still, that would only be three. But, but, but no, to but abandon it, Joseph Smith, Joseph five. Smith is the foundational it's, prophet. It's four plus Joseph Smith. That's five. I'm just saying, are you being impartial? Or are you saying it's more like... No, it's three plus Joseph Smith is four. Because okay, well, these well, are biblical witnesses. Well, okay. Well, In those well, cases, by the way, we actually have their testimony. Okay. And it's within 100 years. Yeah, but, but, but so it's good with, enough. with the New Testament, you don't have Peter's testimony but or, but what or is, James's testimony okay. or for the 500. Or, so you don't have four. You've got... Paul. But what we have is good enough to convince you for, for, for the New Testament, I would. Uh, that's a good point, though, right? What is all the fuss about, Ehrman, if you're already convinced? It seems like this is much ado about a huge nothing burger. Oh, well, you know, are they like Mormon religious claims? You know, we have four plus one is five, you know? Well, no, because the three Mormon eyewitness testimonies referenced are not credible. They undermine their own credibility over time. Peter, James, and Paul did not do that. This cannot be compared as equal. So then what's all the fuss about if you're already convinced that Peter and James and Paul saw the risen Jesus or had the experience of seeing the risen Jesus? Let's stick with but Moroni. that isn't proof that it happened. Right. And Who that, else has Moroni appeared to other than those people in history? <sighs> We're talking about a particular event. Was Jesus raised from the dead and a particular But event? other things can support a, another event, right? So, so if Jesus is appearing to people, for example, all throughout history, if we have eyewitnesses, if that's we have a separate people, argument. Okay. So I think we have to take one argument at a time because okay. if you take, if you just start piling on arguments, we have to consider each of those arguments in turn. Okay, but I'm giving, so my, well, I'm just giving you my reasoning that I why Maroney's not convincing. To I understand, right. but I don't think you've listened to my case here. Okay. So, in one sense, I'm actually on Ehrman's side. I don't know what ongoing sightings of Jesus is going to do to undermine the claims to have seen Moroni, you know? But I'm not on Ehrman's side, in a sense, because I think he's manipulatively framing the discussion to make it more advantageous to his position. So, in my mind, it's one thing to lay a framework with the strong contentions that you have in your arsenal. Uh, I've said that over and over again in debate teacher videos. But it's another thing to manipulatively frame a discussion in order to make your argument look stronger when it's not. Judges notice these things, and it's not going to help you in the long run. And by the way, Christians are just as guilty of this as well. So we're, we're not off the hook when our sign does this too. You are basing everything you said. Not basing everything. You said the bedrock. We're starting with appearances. This isn't my only argument. You said the bedrock is Paul, because Paul gives us the information about Cephas and James. Correct. I, I said I said Paul is the bedrock in the sense that the vast majority of scholars agree when it comes to Paul. How That's many, what I mean by how bedrock. many ancient Christian writings do we have by somebody who says in those writings that he saw Jesus? Directly? Paul. But, Thank but you. oh well, well but how we many have, do we have we have Peter. For, I, I would say Peter wrote first first and second Peter. And second Peter, Jesus I mean Peter says that he saw Saw the transfiguration. Uh, the transfiguration, exactly. That's not the resurrection. Okay. Paul, so you've but got John Paul. saw the risen Jesus. Oop. Oops. That's not good. That's not good, guys. The resurrection is not the transfiguration. You know what? But th these things happen in the heat of the moment. You know, you both sides, you know, it's just, it's your, your heart's going 100 miles an hour. You know, the cameras are rolling. If you're live, you know, you're on stage, you see an audience, right? In the middle of a conversation, you reach for something that isn't quite what you are after, right? So Ehrman got him there. So far, Ehrman is handling not only himself, but Bass very well. 
in spite of the critique that I've already been giving Ehrman, I'd say he definitely has the upper hand in this exchange so far. At least in heaven, in Revelation. Are you you're counting that as a historical source? Of, of seeing something, of seeing Jesus again. That's in another, that would, that would contribute to the argument. Again, that's the point, that these things go back okay. to Let me try again, support because the I original I, I want us to be clear what we're talking claim. about. You have nothing beyond be those three witnesses with Moroni. Okay. Nothing. Let, let me let me finish. Okay. You're saying that Paul gives us the evidence for himself. He saw Jesus, but none of the others. You think Peter wrote First and Second Peter, and okay, but that's that would be two. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that in the case of Moroni giving Joseph Smith the plates, we have four. So if the idea is that you trust eyewitnesses who who swear to what they saw. And that we're doing this impartially. No, no, no. no. Okay. We're doing this impartially as historians. In other words, we're not, yeah. it's not, we're not trying to back up our faith. We're not trying to prove that we're right about something. Historians don't do that. Historians try to figure out what happened in the past. Mm. And they evaluate their sources. Mm. So what I'm saying is, if you're going to take the sources that agree with you, and you say that they're probably right, be, not because they agree with you, but because they're reliable sources, because you've got Paul and you've got Peter, say, Okay, well, I've got four people from Moroni giving the plates. And these people are highly religious people. Their, the religiosity was never questioned. So, again, this is just not true. I mean, Ehrman, who earlier, I think, suggested or alluded to the fact that he knows LDS history, he, he told Bass, you know, you should look into it or something like that, right? So, I mean, Ehrman presents himself as someone who knows what he's talking about as a historian. Okay. You can't sit here then and say that Ehrman is ignorant of the unraveling of the credibility of the other eyewitnesses to Moroni over time. These were the men besides Joseph Smith who claimed to have seen Moroni. And yet here he is trying to say, well, you know, four against two is better. No, it's not. You have, in many scholars' opinions, zero against Peter, James, and Paul, and Mary Magdalene. Those are the ones even Bart Ehrman accepts, by the way. So once again, what is this weird math equation about? If Ehrman already accepts Peter, James, and Paul, and Mary, if you've already accepted their testimonies, then let's move on to the abductive argument. You know, what is the inference to the best explanation for these testimonies, as well as the other facts of history for the establishment of the early church claims about Jesus' resurrection? Can, can we go there at some point? I am not saying that I think that it happened. Mm -hmm. I don't think it happened. Yeah, for good reason. But on your, on the way you're mounting an argument for Paul and Peter, you, I don't see how you can exclude the argument for Moroni. Well, let, let's say from... Well, it's credibility, right? The LDS witnesses have none based on their behavior over time. Peter, James, and Paul's credibility remains intact based on their behavior over time. Justin, so essentially, Justin, is the question here, is there better evidence that the resurrection claims of these first followers of Jesus are better evidence than other claims from other religious traditions like Mormonism and so on, where they also claim to have been eyewitnesses to something miraculous. Exactly. And 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 what what I was saying with the, the when it comes to the four eyewitnesses, one of them is Joseph Smith. No, no, no. There's four in addition to Joseph Smith who claim they saw him. So there's five. No. You know what? Let's look this up. Okay, so this is from uh Church of Jesus this is a Mormon website, Church of Jesus Christ dot org. Uh witnesses of the Book of Mormon. The first edition of the Book of Mormon featured two testimonials, one written by a group of three witnesses and another by a group of eight to make eleven. Three witnesses, Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris, declared an angel of God appeared to them and showed them the Book of Mormon plates, and they heard the voice of the Lord pronounce that Joseph Smith's translation had been accomplished by the gift and power of God. This experience took place in June 1829 near the home of Peter Whitmer Sr. in Fayette, New York. An additional eight witnesses... Members of the Smith and Whitmer families declared that Joseph Smith himself showed them the plates and allowed each to have the... Okay, so now we're on to the plates. So you have three witnesses who claim to have seen an angel, plus Joseph Smith makes four, not five. You didn't realize this video was going to be heavy in math tonight, huh? Okay, <laughs> Okay. well, regardless, but I, I guess I want to hear why you... It's, if it's you do multiple, regard them as different in some way to the Mormons. Because they're claiming a supernatural being named Moroni appeared to them, Okay. And so who else then has this Moroni figure appeared to? Because there's been other people that have claimed supernatural things have happened. But see, one of the things that I would say, well, who, who else has they appeared to, right? Okay. And, and Moron, who else has Moroni appeared to? Well, that again, 
I don't understand this line of argumentation. Uh, I, I think it's better to point out the credibility of the eyewitness testimony than it is to try to stack numbers of citing it against each other. And Ehrman is probably going to slap back on this. So let's see what happens. So, so then those so four. Now, now, I just want you to agree that's a separate argument now. Yeah, but you it contributes. So let me. I build a just, case with yeah, multiple exactly, arguments. I get it. It's not just one. So when it comes to corroborative evidence of later witnesses, what about the angel? What about the uh, Mother Mary? Mm -hmm. Now, Mary appears regularly to people. It's completely well documented. Thousands of people claim this happens. Um, and um, I'm going to assume that since you're not Catholic, you don't think these appearances happened. I'm open to the. So instead of answering Bass's question about other sightings of Jesus, Ehrman decides to ask about sightings of Mary now. Again, by the way, Ehrman has the upper hand in this exchange. Uh, Bass should not follow him down these new paths of conversation. He should just stick to early resurrection sightings and the inference to the best explanation for those sightings. That's what the conversation is supposed to be focused on. Evidence, and I do think some of the stories okay, of, so what of do you Mary think of is the compelling. Evidence? I think some of the stories is compelling. You think she does appear to people? But I think what the issue no, no, with... No, do you think she appears to people? No, I don't. I, I don't know. You just said the evidence was compelling. Well, I said it's, it's, it's you know, it's something to look into. I'm saying it's enough to look Why into. Why don't you look into it? This would be well, very I, important. I have, I have looked okay, into it. Okay, so... But, but let me answer. I, I think it lacks the unexpectedness. So, so it makes, oh. and, it, and, it, and it normally happens in Catholic context. No, no, this is completely wrong. It no, no, not, well, not, let, 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 let's let Justin finish his point. It normally happens in Catholic contexts. Okay. Okay. And, and so people who are already Catholic, yes. who expect, you know, they pray to Mary regularly. They expect saints to, to, they pray to saints. They expect this kind of thing. And it's happened in only, you know, a handful of type of, of situations. That, that have actually been confirmed by the church. But but I ask you, if Mary is actually appearing to people, would that support the resurrection or not support the resurrection? No, I'm saying that you have better... No, answer that question. Mm -hmm. I will answer it by telling you that we have better evidence for Mary appearing to people, many groups of people in the modern period, than we have for Jesus appearing to people in the modern period. Okay. By your criteria, that would mean that it's more likely that Mary is showing up. By your criteria. By and my criteria, neither one happens. Okay, but if Mary is appearing to people, does it more support the resurrection or not? If she, um, yes, if Mary if Mary is showing up to people, then okay. that would support. The so resurrection. your example to parallel to kind of thwart I, the evidence for the resurrection actually would support the resurrection. No, no, no. You're not understanding. No, uh, Ehrman's argument is that based on Bass's criteria for assessing the validity of the resurrection claims, he must then accept claims to see Mary, which it appears he does not accept at the moment um so this is a bit of a nuanced argument my issue is we have veered way way out into the weeds from the original topic and that's on bass just as much as ermin so uh this discussion so far is a bit of a mess <laughs> but you know ermin has control he's handling himself extremely well as an interlocutor against bass tiny my argument i'm saying that you but are, that's true right what no, i just it's said not, is true no you're not you just admitted that you said if mary had, had is appearing to people and you think there's a lot of evidence for it. I don't think so. I think it lacks the unexpectedness. The, 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 the apostles, these people like Paul, Peter, Mary, were in no way expecting Jesus to appear to them. In no way. I, so, I so, so Catholics who expect, that can have an expectation for this type of thing, it makes sense why it would, why it would happen. So you have, you, it, so the but, arguments you know, the problem for the, is for the, you're arguing about four three that we talked about is stronger. At once. You're arguing three or four things at once. I don't think you've read the literature on Mary because in many, many oh, instances. I've read a lot of it, yeah. Laurentine, yeah. Then you know full well that many times it's not uh, expected. So, um, because if you've read the literature. So. No, no, of course it's expected. That's the point. No, then you in, haven't read the literature. No, well, in there the, are in many testimonies context, of people who are not, who don't expect it and can't believe it. Yeah, but they know about Christianity. They know about people appearing How to many people. people. They know about the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. That's what I'm saying. That and is that different the, from Jesus showing up to people? They're in the Christian worldview. Yeah, well, well, where was the expectation for, uh, this for is, Jesus This is, this is a key, key part of what you discussed. <laughs> you mean discussed by people who knew him? <laughs> yeah, what was the expectation? <laughs> but Where's the expectation for Mary? They're not expecting her to show up, and she does. But they're in a worldview that could, that they allows that. They are too in a worldview. No. They're in an apocalyptic where, where, worldview okay, that where, expects Where was the Messiah? Where was the expectation? It's interesting to watch this because Ehrman is playing games right now. And I suspect he knows he is. And he can get away with this because not a lot of people are aware of, again, this manipulative framing that he's doing. 
You know, for example, uh, well, the Jews were apocalyptic and therefore you were totally expecting Jesus to rise again, right? Well, two things about that. First, they were not expecting Jesus to die in the first place. Why? Because it was not expected for the Messiah to die. So you have to include in your calculations the likelihood that they abandoned the notion that Jesus was the Messiah the moment that he died on the cross, right? Whoops, we followed just another false Messiah, which by the way, there were a lot of them floating around at the time. Second, apocalyptic Jews were expecting all the dead to rise again on the last day, hence the term apocalyptic. On the last day, at the very end, when the judgment comes, all were expected to rise again. This explains uh, Martha's response to Jesus when he said he would raise Lazarus from the dead. Uh, John 11, verse 23, Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha wasn't a Sadducee. She believed in the resurrection at the very end. That was the expectation of resurrection for apocalyptic Jews, which explains, I think, part of Thomas's doubt, right? I'm sure he was looking around and hearing claims that Jesus was alive again and realizing, well, this isn't the end. So Bass's claim that this is unexpected is likely from the apostles' perspectives. But you got Ehrman going, oh, no, it's, it's not unlikely at all. I call shenanigans on that one. Expectation of a Messiah rising again from the dead. Tell me that. That isn't the that isn't what generated the uh, the appearances. Of they course. thought they saw Jesus afterwards. Of course, because he actually then appeared to them. But, then but, but, they but, concluded but, he was the Messiah. But if he didn't appear they to them like you believe, expecting the Messiah to rise. How did they expect? I, well, then how did they? And they weren't expecting Mary to appear. Okay, then how did they believe Jesus appeared to them? They saw him. Okay. So What's, what did they see? Well, how do we know? What, what, what do they see when they see Mary? You don't think they see Mary. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I think some of the evidence for the Mary see? is they saw something. Well, I think they saw yeah. something with Jesus, too, of course. Yeah. I've never but, argued but, but, against But that. that's the thing. It led them to say something that was completely unexpected. Yes. So I think, it, I think it's compelling so evidence can I just, that for, for, it because actually you guys is the raised Jesus. Ten to the dozen here. And I just exactly. want to, for, for, the, for the sake of the, the viewer or listener, I just want to be really clear on this point that you're making at this point, Justin, because there's a lot of different points being thrown out here. But, but it's that you, you say that the idea of a resurrected Messiah who had been crucified and resurrected was completely unexpected in exactly. that Jewish and culture. And, and therefore, is what you're essentially saying, it's unlikely they would have made something like that up. Yeah. There had to be some kind of experience well, that came behind that claim because it was such an unexpected claim. Whereas, I think what I understand you saying, appearances of the Virgin Mary, although they may not have been expected in that moment or whatever by the people right. who are experiencing them, there is a general expectation among in Catholicism that that sort of thing mm -hmm. happens and therefore it's mm -hmm. not it's, so it's, hard it's to believe that, that yeah. it's so been I'd generated. So where did they get the idea? I'd like to, I'd okay. like to respond Please. to that. I, I just wanted to make sure we got that yeah, really clear. No, I think but, it's, a good, okay. it's a good clarification because okay. okay. I think that's absolutely right. Okay. And I think it's what happened with the followers of Jesus as well. Okay, go on. <laughs> they did not expect a Messiah to be raised from the dead. There was no expectation that a Messiah was going to die and raise from the dead. So they didn't expect that. The question is, what happened to generate that belief? Mm -hmm. My view... According to Ehrman, what happened was Peter, James, and Paul and Mary had an experience of seeing Jesus alive again. Now, what is the best explanation for their experience of seeing Jesus? That's where this conversation should have gone, like in the first, like, five minutes. Because Ehrman began the conversation by agreeing that Peter, James, and Paul and Mary had that experience of seeing the risen Jesus is it's absolutely right that sure Peter probably, Mary probably, Paul certainly I would say, thought they saw Jesus alive afterwards. There, something happened to them to make them think that Jesus was alive. It's not because they were expecting the Messiah to rise from the no, dead. No, it wasn't. Right. What we don't know <laughs> is who else had these experiences. What we know is that there were claims that other people did after the first people claimed it. Okay. And so once, once you have a follower of Jesus like Peter say, I saw the Lord, it's not implausible. In fact, it, others start saying, oh, I saw him too. So, so that's a not, so it's the scenario. same thing with Mary. It's exactly the same thing. And so my point is, is not that that proves that Mary was raised from the dead or anything. My point is that if that's the kind of argument you want to make about Jesus, you can make it about other people that is just as, but, but just is, as plausible. Is, is the historical. So this is Ehrman critiquing Bass here. And the critique isn't exactly correct. Uh, 
but it's not way off the mark either. Ehrman is right in the way that he frames this. If you want to count numbers of witnesses, then let's talk about numbers of witnesses to other religions. The problem is all of this is a huge deviation from where this conversation started, um, where this conversation should have stayed from the very beginning, because Ehrman agrees about Peter, James, Paul, and Mary. What is the best explanation for these folks talking about seeing the risen Jesus? Particularly Paul, who was an enemy of Christians initially, and then completely flipped and became an outspoken Christian. Why? Because he said he saw the risen Jesus. If we could just bring this conversation back to that, that would be awesome. Well, issue here then that you think that this claim that the messiah had been raised was kind of a post facto kind of, oh, yeah. uh, sort of rationalization of yeah, these they experiences they had they thought he was the messiah before he died in my my judgment right. so they did think he was the messiah and they weren't went, expecting him to die right he died one of them two of them three of them said i've seen the lord and then they had to figure out well how how does that work? Uh, and it must mean if, if he's if he's alive again, it must mean that God's raised him from the dead. But there were other. These are apocalyptic Jews. Apocalyptic Jews. The only way they can imagine life after death is an embodied existence. They don't believe the soul lives on after death. These are Jews. Jews believe that the body and soul are one thing and that afterlife, if there is an afterlife, it's body and soul. No, so but, but, that if they see Jesus alive afterwards, it must mean that his soul has come back into his body. How does that happen? It can only happen when God does it. Okay. God has raised him from the dead. Once they say they raised him from the dead and they already knew he was the Messiah, that's when they start saying okay. the Messiah was raised. Quick response and we'll go. That's an interesting account of what potentially happened, except it leaves out key factors like all of Jesus claims to be God. To, to self-identify as the Yahweh that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. It, it leaves out Jesus' own claim to raise himself from the dead. John chapter 2, verse 19 says, Jesus answered them, destroy this sanctuary, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, uh, it took 46 years to build this sanctuary, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the sanctuary of his body. Now check this out. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Ehrman is ignoring the testimony of the disciples themselves, if we were to take John's accounting at face value. So it's not just that Jesus' disciples were trying to fit his resurrection into some kind of Judaistic framework, uh, but they also recognized the claims that he was making about himself. He is Yahweh. He forgives sins. This is uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 6. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. Only God can forgive sins. Luke 5, 21 shows us the moment that the scribes and Pharisees flipped out over Jesus making this claim. Verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark chapter 2, verse 7 says the same thing. So, once again, we have an historian who touts his role and his knowledge, but mysteriously leaves out key pieces that appear to undermine his arguments. And you have to ask the question, why does he do that? Uh, is this really an exercise in seeking truth, or is something else going on here? Now, just in that last section, Bart, you were sort of obviously going at it with Justin there as to whether this constitutes evidence for a resurrection, or whether it's just a sort of post hoc rationalization by apocalyptic Jews of the fact that they had some kind of an experience. Now, what do you say those experiences were? They said it was of a physically resurrected Messiah. What do you say they, they probably actually experienced from your perspective? Um, Once again, bear in mind that Ehrman disqualifies himself in his own writings to be someone who can actually answer this question. Why? Because historians don't answer these questions. So if he decides to answer the question, He'll do so no longer as a historian. That is, if he wants to remain consistent with his own statements. So let's see what happens. So we, we have lots of records, of course, of people being seen after they're dead. 
uh, it happens, as I was saying earlier, it just just today it happens for one out of eight people. They see something and they assume they think it's that person or they hear or they touch. They can feel them and all sorts of experiences like that. And throughout history, there have been all these thousands of appearances of Mother Mary. And there uh, we have eyewitnesses to Romulus being raised from the dead. People saw him after he died. Apollonius of Tian. We have, you know, we have all. So in every instance, you do have to ask. Of course, the historian wants to know what really happened. And in most cases, all you can do is come up with options. We don't, there's no way of knowing what they saw, um, partly because they don't tell us. In this case, we only have one person who actually said he saw Jesus, and that's Paul, but he doesn't actually say what he saw. He says that God revealed his son to me, and he says, I saw, I saw Jesus, but he doesn't give us any details, so we don't we don't know. Uh, it, but it's quite easy to come up with a list of things that have led to the, that kind of claim over the centuries and still led today. Some people have a dream. They think that, you know, that they were awake when they saw it. So I'll just repeat this again. When you choose your words carefully to say, the only one who saw the risen Jesus is Paul, you're misleading folks with the actual historical evidence that is accepted by other scholars. Paul says that Peter and James as well saw the risen Jesus. Peter was a contemporary of Paul. He knew Paul. When it came time to write 1 and 2 Peter, you think he would have clarified that Paul made a false claim about him seeing the risen Jesus? You think that makes sense for Peter to do? But no, instead, Peter says in 1 Peter 1, we are born again because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You also have to think for a moment, where did Paul get this idea that Peter saw the risen Jesus, right? And it appears the answer is the oral tradition that came to Paul that he relayed through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 3 says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep after that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So if you take Paul as being reliable enough to at least relay that he had an experience of seeing the risen Jesus, can we not also take Paul as being reliable enough to relay the oral tradition of the early church that Peter saw the risen Jesus? So no, it's not that only Paul said he saw Peter. Ehrman accepts that Peter, James, Paul, and Mary said they saw the risen Jesus. Some people have hallucinations. Um, some people see somebody who looks similar and they mistake him. Somebody sees something at a distance. I mean, there, there are, so what happened in the case of, of Peter or Paul, I, I, we, we can't say, uh, just as we can't say for any of the others. And but, so that's but my point. You don't think they would just... And there it is. So I said at the outset of this video to watch Ehrman because he'll only get so far and then he'll stop and draw a line in the sand and say, well, you can't say whether or not Jesus rose again. And there it is. Inventing it. They, they had so. some kind of an experience. Some people think so. But, but, but so, not the one that they claimed to I have I really had don't think Paul was making things up. I right. just don't. Yeah. I don't think okay. he's lying about right. it. He and, really saw it. He saw Jesus. Yeah. And I'll just add, you know, Bart says this is happening all the time. Where does someone project an enemy apparition? What, what oh, it happens sometimes. If you feel guilty, for example, if you feel guilty about what you've done to somebody leading to... Give me to, an example. Um, well, if you read the psychological literature on uh, visions, you actually find a good bit of it. I Anything mean, specific? Well, they aren't names that you would... Know. They're just people. I mean, yeah. they're just people, you yeah. know... The, Pretty sure. You, you Not did, in the literature. You, Not in the literature. No. Okay, well, I suggest you there, read it. <laughs> there is no projection of enemies in the literature. Dale Allison would... Would, would yeah, so um, what I'd say is that some people have hypothesized that, that uh, Paul felt very guilty, or that, that Peter, sorry, Peter felt very guilty about his denial of Jesus, mm -hmm. and that he started out, you know, and so because of his guilt, he saw something. It's, it's very common. One of the most common reasons for seeing a bereaved loved one is because you felt like you mistreated them before they died, and the guilt creates a, mm -hmm. and so. But again, that doesn't guarantee. So. Interesting how Bass asks for enemy attestation. What he's asking about is the explanation for somebody like Paul seeing there is in Jesus. And Ehrman now starts talking about Peter. Did you notice that? What's that about? Saying an unparalleled so claim saying, of resurrection of a Messiah that was crucified. 
He and, could have felt like he forgave him, but not, it doesn't mean he, he would have and, said that. And not only that, but I've never said it did. And so that isn't my claim. Um, <laughs> you and said so, that's what's caused Peter's claim. Peter did not He didn't have, claim Jesus rose from the dead? Okay. What I've been saying is, mm -hmm. G Peter did not claim that the Messiah got raised from the dead the second he saw Jesus. What he thought was Jesus had come back to okay, life. You're saying he, he figured it out as an apoc apocalyptic Jew. I, I'm, I'm going with your argument, yeah. But but Paul, how does Paul imagine right, I was a getting to that. crucified man I was getting to that. Uh, rising from the dead that he hates, that he thinks cursed by God, appearing to him? I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Okay, go ahead. Wow, it's getting spicy. Which, by the way, while you are absolutely allowed to interrupt your interlocutor and ask specific questions that are advantageous for your position, the bottom line is this, this isn't a debate, though. So when you do what is more typically accepted in a debate, like in a regular discussion, you come across as rude, and <laughs> Ehrman is definitely letting his nonverbals and some of his verbals express how his interlocutor is being rude. Uh, so this isn't a great look from Bass. I can even see Justin Brierley getting a little uncomfortable there. <laughs> but here's the thing. Bass is making some good points, though. So this is where you have to make a decision as someone in a context like this. Do you press hard, you know, or, or, or do you choose your moments? It, 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 this is definitely an art for sure. But, um, so Paul did not get this information from Peter and James. Paul was persecuting Christians before he ever met Peter and James. So he knows the Christian claims already. There have been a lot of uh, psychological analyses about what might have happened to somebody who feels guilt over what they're doing to these people that would generate a vision and to have a conversion. As you probably know, there are instances in which people who are enemies of Christ have visions in which, in which they get converted. And so okay. Paul would be in that category. Okay, just so we're clear, according to Ehrman, who cannot answer these questions as an historian, Peter and Paul felt guilty. And so they coincidentally had experiences of a risen Jesus. These were not together. Uh, these were on separate occasions. And then coincidentally concluded the same exact thing, which was not commensurate with apocalyptic expectation of Jews in the first century. Ehrman agreed with that, by the way. That was not the expectation. So if they were both feeling guilty, why did they have the same experience? Why did they both draw the same conclusion? Why not manifest their guilt in separate subjective ways, right? And why not draw different interpretive conclusions about their experience? And then, and then you got to think too, like, what is a more plausible explanation based on their similar experience and exact same conclusion that Jesus really did rise from the dead or that this was a coincidence or something? I suspect how you answer that question will come down to whether or not you accept the existence of miracles in the first place, which is a presupposition folks smuggle into this conversation, and it's almost always left unexamined, but almost always explains folks' resistance to the idea that Jesus really did rise from the dead. That probably explains Ehrman's resistance as well. He presupposes that miracles cannot happen. Sundar Singh, by the way, would be a great example of this. This was a, an Indian that became a great missionary. He was burning Bibles. He was persecuting Christians in the early 1900s. And ultimately, he had a vision of Jesus, and he, and he was transformed like Paul. But again, that happened after the Christian claim has already been made. Yes, yeah, so, 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 did so, Paul. Paul. so did Paul. Yeah. That's my point. It's exactly the same. So you can't say that it doesn't happen to enemies. So you think he understood. Because you just the, gave the example of an enemy where it happened. So you think he understood the Christian claim clearly as he was persecuted. He understood that they were saying Jesus got raised from the dead. Absolutely. Okay. And then Why he else was he persecuted? And then he imagined on the Damascus Road. I didn't say he imagined, imagined anything on the Damascus Road. What, what happened on the Damascus Road? I just said that there are lots of options, and we don't know because he doesn't okay. tell us. Okay. Well, he One said thing, he, he, saw, he saw the Lord Jesus. That's what he said. He I said, said he saw the Lord Jesus. Jesus but what okay. did he, how did, okay, where did he see him? When did he see him? How did he see him? How close was he? Mm -hmm. Did they talk? Did well, they spend a week together? Seeing him's good enough, right? He thought he saw Jesus. I've, I've been saying that all well, along. Well, he look, thought he saw Jesus. I'm not expecting I'm asking why you don't, think, why you don't believe him. Why, why do you think Paul's wrong? Why don't I think a person got raised from the dead? Yes. Oh, why, why don't you think Jesus got raised from the dead? I don't think anybody got raised from the dead. Okay. I, because it's a, it violates the laws of nature. Okay. Okay. I mean, and there it is. We have now discovered the reason why Ehrman will never say that Jesus rose from the dead. Doesn't matter what kind of evidence lines up for it. There can be no evidence that would actually lead to that conclusion. 
And we also see now why Ehrman couches his language in such a manner in order to provide as many problems as he can with the resurrection accounts from Peter, James, Paul, and Mary. Resurrections do not happen. Period. End of story. The end. It's a violation of the laws of physics. Here is where the true clash lies, ladies and gentlemen. We've discovered the root under the ground. It should be Bass's job now to make Ehrman defend this claim that resurrections never happen. If we want this conversation to proceed productively. K kind of a materialist, fundamentalist view. Well, of, let me ask this. Of, you, I mean, you think God raised Jesus life? from the dead, yeah. right? Do you think God can break the laws of mathematics? Can God, God make can't this contradict himself, no. Because no, right. he, he is. Exactly. It, mathematics is his language. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. The other language he uses is physics. Mm -hmm. Can he break the laws of physics? I mean, I think we're getting off. Well, no, no, we are not. Getting off. This is precisely. You well, asked me why I don't believe it. Well, and the reason I don't believe it is because it violates the laws oh, of oh, physics. Well, and I don't well, he think can God, feed things into his system. For sure, I don't think God can break the law of physics any more than he can break the law of mathematics. Feeding things into his system to bring a dead person to life is not the same thing as making two plus two five. That's it's, completely different things. Uh, they are both laws that have never been broken in history, except in the case of Jesus. Gosh. Um, Oh, man. Divine agency is not a law of physics. Th this is understandable even on a human level. If I hold this phone up in the air, I am not allowing the laws of physics to take its course, right? Which law of physics am I talking about? The law of gravity. If I let this phone go, then of course the law of gravity will take its course. But have I violated the law of physics with my human agency? No. If the God of the Bible exists and he decides to intervene in the everyday lives of his people is he violating the law of physics to do so no in the same way that my agency does not allow for certain laws of physics to take its course on a particular object so should the divine agent act in the world as a matter of fact this is a this is a philosophical position that ehrman has adopted he cannot scientifically disprove miracles as a matter of fact as a materialist he has no criteria to identify a miracle if they did actually exist why? Because he begins with the presupposition that they cannot happen. Doesn't sound very scientific of him, does it? Right. So here's the question. This is a very big, no, it's a very big question. Because what you're arguing is that the most probable event that happens with Jesus, because Paul and Peter said it happened, the most probable thing is the violation of a law of physics that has never been violated for in 13.8 billion years. Never except in this one instance. Well, now, if you're a historian, historians don't argue that something that happened only once in all of history is the most probable occurrence because somebody said it happened. Unless it Let me also point out that, that what Ehrman is saying right now was the position of Hume, Spinoza, and others back in the day, that miracles were violations of the laws of physics or the laws of nature. Uh, but this definition is outdated and has been corrected by a number of folks. Uh, John Ehrman has a great book on this called Hume's Abject Failure. Miracles are not relegated to one definition. They can be understood in ways that have nothing to do with the violation of the laws of physics. Even to say the word laws of physics is misleading. These are not inviolable laws. And the understanding of physics famously breaks down at the quantum level, which should not force anyone into this rigid definition of <laughs> miracles. There's an incredible evidence the incredible evidence it, it, is that Paul said so. Not just so. that. Not just well, that. Well, We're but, just but, getting started. But what's interesting here for me, Bart, though, is that presumably, on the face of it, if, if you do believe that God would never, if there is a God, let's say, that that God would never break the laws of physics, then on the face of it, you could no amount of evidence could persuade you of a miraculous claim. You, you've kind of decided that before you come no, to No, no, you'd have to, what you'd have to do is you'd have to have evidence from physicists that these laws don't apply. Okay, so you'd have to go to the physicist rather than you the historian. You certainly can prove it, to, because to, physicists... So you go to the physicist for the evidence. Well, 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 if you're going to say that the laws of physics have been broken one time hmm. in the history of the human race, then you need pretty good evidence. And the evidence that somebody said they saw somebody... But that's not, not the real. only evidence, and we're going to... So here's how to argue like Bart Ehrman. You frame the discussion around a definition of miracles that is advantageous to your position, which many would not agree with Spinoza's or Hume's definition of miracles. And I'm not even talking about Christians. And then you use that definition as a basis for the rest of your argument. Are you keeping track? I talk about more, but that's not the only evidence. We're, we're, we were talking about the appearances and the appearances, I think. And, and you said this, I, and I've appreciated you said this in how, Je in, in how Jesus became God. You talk about how basically the evidence is consistent with if Jesus did rise from the dead. And I appreciate that because you're saying if Jesus rose from the dead, basically the evidence we have 
looks looks the same. It would look the same. So you don't believe he rose from the dead, but the evidence does let me support like the miracle. Do you agree with it, that? Let me no. Let me no. Of course I don't. Believe. Well, well, okay. Consistent with the miracle. Let let me. Is it consistent let, with the miracle? Let me put it this way. Um, there is a famous Jewish holy man, Baal Shem Tov, mm -hmm. who um, eyewitnesses have told us. I uh, lived in the 18th century. He told us they can. He could heal the sick. He could uh, cast out demons. He could raise the dead. Uh, we have eyewitness accounts of this. And my suspicion is that you don't think it really happened because you'd be suspicious of those reports. I, I think the fact that nobody outside of Hasidic Jews think it happened is quite Okay, who outside of Christians think that Jesus was raised from the dead? Uh, Pincus Lapid. He was a Jewish historian and scholar. <laughs> He wrote a book called The Resurrection of Jesus. You should read it. It's actually really good. He actually was convinced by the evidence that Jesus uh -huh. rose from the dead. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. You should read it. I, it's really I mean, good. I, it's guess, I guess. I guess. Okay. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. We're back to the. Well, what about other religious claims like the LDS Church? Okay. Got it. By the way, who besides Christians saw the risen Jesus? Paul. Right. The basis of becoming a Christian, though, is seeing the risen Jesus. So, I mean, that's <laughs> just a weird way to say that. Oh my gosh, this was a. Uh, Fascinating discussion. I think there's no doubt that in terms of debate, Bart Ehrman handled himself much better than Justin Bass, which is ironic because if you go beyond the rhetoric and get to the root of the issue, Ehrman's substantive issue with resurrection claims is his philosophical presupposition that miracles just don't happen, guys, right? Justin Bass did make some good moves against Ehrman, particularly as he pointed out that Ehrman accepts that Peter, James, Paul, and Mary experienced what they believed was there is in Jesus, but then he really wanted to talk about appearances over time and focus on like the numbers of sightings or something. He also didn't really challenge Ehrman as well as I think he could have. So I would say Ehrman dominated Bass throughout the conversation, largely because Bass just didn't challenge him well enough. Uh, those are my thoughts. What do you think? How did these two interlocutors do? How would you have responded to Ehrman? Let me know in the comments below. As always, I hope something here blessed you as you get out there and engage others for Jesus Christ. I will take a break and return soon with more videos, but in the meantime, I'll say bye for now.